we are busy with a series of nine ways how we can connect with God. It's interesting how God prayed as different. And then today I want to speak about nature. A Christian is going to speak about contemplation. And and how is ways how in in terms of how some of us connect with God. Now I think nature is my strongest way in terms of connecting with God. I've connected with God stronger in nature than in any church before. Um, in, in fact, <laughs> when I studied theology, I turned atheist in my first year. And uh, that is, this nature was one of the ways how God brought me back again. We challenged me with questions and said, Oh, you say the gathering is all about mass hysteria and everything happens within mass hysteria. Explain to me the strong presence that you felt that day when you were alone at the day. And I remember there was a day where I had such a strong presence of God in the car where I sat alone next to the dad, where I just started crying and weeping and where my, I couldn't respond but to, to cry. And then I was so overwhelmed by His presence and it was just me. Me, myself, and I am the Creator. And, and, I, and, and, and when I go back in life, my strongest times that I connected with God, the strongest presence that I ever felt was in nature. So if people would ask who connects in nature, I will jump up first. Now I remember as a young boy, growing up in the farm, I loved nature. Um, the two things that made me happy, or the three things that made me happy in my life was my rifle, my horse, and the mountain. And I would go up in, in, in the mountain with my horse weekend after weekend, and, and I even had a little hut that I built for myself there, and I would go and sleep in the hut, and just my horse, my rifle, and myself. And, and I remember on this mountain, I would overlook all the farms. At night, and at night you would see the stars, and, and then it's like a valley from the top of this mountain, and it was all the farms, you could see all the farmhouses. And all of a sudden, as a young boy, everything looked small from up there. And if there's one thing that I always remember, and even this morning when I was thinking about, about this, and I closed my eyes, I felt as, as, as if I was sitting on that mountain again. And I could again feel the presence of God on that mountain. Young boy, didn't really understand what God was about. Didn't grow up in a religious home. Didn't have all the what was. But when I was on that mountain, I realized, wow, look at this. There's a creator of it. And I connected with him without knowing what he was all about. Not even knowing what religion is all about. But I knew that there was a God and I felt something different when I sat on that mountain at night thinking about God. And I didn't even take my Bible with me. I thought that I even had a Bible back then. But it was all about the stars and what I felt and experienced and maybe one of you connects with God in the same way. I want to encourage you to go and sit in nature. So let's go on a journey. I've got a couple of verses, and maybe I'm not going to preach that much, but I'm definitely going to read a couple of verses. Good. It's interesting how God would use elements of nature, even within the Bible, to speak to people. Have you noticed that? 
Moses walking through the desert, he's seen bushes and bushes before, and then one day there's the one that's different. I mean, this one is burning, and it's not burning up. It's like, oh man, that's strange. I've never seen that. Because that's not how it normally acts and reacts. This is different. And because he knew nature and was living within nature and interacted with nature, God drew his attention through nature. And, and when he saw the bush, there was a strong presence of God. So much so that he got to a place where he took out his sandals because he was on holy ground. And he was not even in church. Because God is greater than a church building. God is greater than our mindsets and our boxes that we put in him. His holiness is greater than that. And, 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 and when you saw that, it was like, wow, this is holy ground. And he had a revelation that changed his life and that changed the outcome of his life forever because of interaction through nature. Look at Elijah. When he was at a place where he ran away from a woman that said that she was going to kill him, after he killed how many Baal priests? He ran away from one woman and he went to sit in a cave. <laughs> you relate to it. <laughs> and he went to sit in a cave and, and in that place he was seeking God. And it's interesting how God came again and spoke to him through nature. The Bible says that there was an earthquake. Woo, dramatic. The whole earth is moving. And then we would expect that you would find God in that power. And then the Bible says, but God was not in it. And then the wind. And I mean, you know what wind can be like. And God was not in it. Then fire, I mean fire, you know what when these mountains burn, you battle to kill a fire because it just destroys and distracts and consumes everything. And, and you would think that within that mighty powerful natural phenomena, God would be in it. And the Bible says God was not in it. And then he says something beautiful, and he says, and then there was a stone small voice. Everything happened. All this destruction of elements of nature settled down and peace and calmness fell over the cave where he sat. In that peace, the Bible says, in the still small voice, in that was God. And how he found himself in his faith in God again. And God used nature. Now, if he used other people or nature for people in biblical times, why not us? Nothing changed. See, so when we look at Jesus, he says later, the same day Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. Some translations say sea. The Sea of Galilee was a big lake. And then I understand why when I go and sit on the rocks at the sea and I listen to the sound of the waters, that there's something that happens in my soul. I mean, even Jesus took time to search out nature. See, there's times where the Bible says that he went to go and pray on top of a mountain. There's times where he went into what, what did you speak of last week, where he went into the desert. And, and there were times that he went to sit among the olive trees and pray. So there's times where Jesus seek out nature and leave the buzziness of human beings behind. And just kind of sit in nature because there's something about nature and how we can connect to God. If it was important for Jesus, hey man, I'm first in mind. <laughs> oh yeah, looking at the, the mountain, I, I don't know, just wait. I don't know when last you were on a mountain, but when you're up on a mountain, everything looks small underneath. And it's as if you've got a bird's eye view over everything. Maybe there's something spiritual in that. 
Because when we can soar like an eagle, we will soar above our problems. Isn't that so? And we can see it from an eagle's point of view. Now I've got scripture in the Old Testament to prove that. But I want to top that. Doesn't that Bible say that we are seated with Him on the right hand of God? In heavenly places? And he's using the word we are seated with him in the heavenly places. So that means as you are here, you are also above. And you also have the ability to look down above everything that's happening in your life. And I think, this is my understanding, that the times that when we go up a mountain, it is when the, 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 the spiritual things, start making sense to us within a natural manifestation. So you start seeing in the natural what God is saying in the spiritual. And I can speak for myself, that is what nature helps me with. To understand a lot of spiritual things by seeing the natural things. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and Sky, through everything God, uh, though, through everything God made, they can clearly see His invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Romans 1:20. So even the Bible says that when people see nature, they realize that there must be a God, and it's undeniably so, because. When you look at nature, it just screams, there's a creator. Something made me. I could not become or start to exist out of nothing, out of myself. Psalm 19 verse 1, Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God and the skies above proclaim His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals the knowledge. Nature scream that there is a God. Day after day, night after night. When you look at daytime, you see the beauty of God's creation. And what a beautiful time we live. And at night time where it's dark, we can't see far, you just look up and you see the stars and the moon and everything that's happening up there. It's beautiful. And the beauty of it is that I don't need to understand what the different stars are and what's their names and, and what they are called and how they work and what's keeping them up there and they don't fall down. I don't need to know nothing about that. By just looking at them, I am full Now, no wonder David wrote Psalm 8, when I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Now I can just imagine that David as a shepherd boy was lying on his back looking up at the stars. And when he saw the stars, I think he was overwhelmed with the presence of God and the greatness of God. And in that moment of greatness, he just felt so small. It's like, wow! And then yet, oh man, if he is so big, if nature is so big, if, if the sky is so big, how big must our God be? And then it's like, oh man, look how small I am. And then he realized that if I am so small, what is it? That God still wants to have fellowship with me. What is man that he is mindful of me? Why is it that he wants to fellowship with me and wants to make time for me? And why is it that he wants to search me? And I think the one great mystery looking at the skies just brings up the next mystery. What is it that he is in love with us? Why is it that He gave His Son to die for us because He loved us? 
And I think it's when we look at the skies and nature that we can ask those questions. And sometimes we can ask questions without having answers because sometimes there's no point in having answers. Because the question is so great in itself that we don't need no answers. And I believe this is one of them. You can go into a theological debate about why God is spending time with people and why he's mindful of us. And he knows he's not going to face me. <laughs> because the moment in asking that question is greater than the moment of the answer. And I think sometimes we need more moments of questions. And a lot of times for me, questions are brought forth by things that I see and experience that is so awesome and so great in the negative or in the positive. So now Jesus is speaking and he says, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon, all his glory, was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are there, that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so many faith? Isn't that awesome? We live in a beautiful town. I mean, when you look at nature, when you walk the cliff paths, when you look at the sea, when you look at the mountains, when you go and walk in the mountains, and you realize that we are, as human beings, are God's prime creation. And everything you see was created not only to sustain us, but also for our good. But we can stand and say, wow, look at this, wow, look at this flower. And in the moment we go, wow, look at this flower, we actually acknowledge the creator behind the flower. But then he comes and he says, that, you know what, I'm looking after this. When I said you watered the Perkia plant up on the cliff, close to your house, in the mountain. When I said you gone up into water. I doubt that you ever did it. But the beauty is that that Perkia is flowering year after year without even your knowledge. And God is looking after. And now Jesus comes and he says, when you look at nature, you see the beauty. And you didn't even have no hand in it in the upkeep. You have no hand in it whatsoever. And it's just there for your beauty. And now he comes and says, God is doing that. And then he says, when you think of a guy living in Splendid, in Solomon, in all his glory, in all his splendor, was not even clothed like nature. And then he says, if God cares for nature, and nature is even more glorious, and, more, more, and there's more splendor within that, than the guy that had all the wealth to create the glory and the splendor, and he's looking after that, how much more will he look after you that is valuable to him? That he created with eternal value. That he created so much so that his son died for you because he valued you. And then he says, you know what, that flower will be there for a season and then it's gone forever. But yet God was there for that flower in its season. He created its beauty so that the flowers can shout out to you that He cares for you and that He wants to care for you and that He wants to clothe you and that He wants to provide for you. So whenever you walk on the cliff parks and you see the flowers and, the, and nature, just think of this. God is caring for those flowers and the bushes and the fables and whatever. That He's got no eternal value. How much more will He then seek out to clothe you and to provide you? We all know the story of the rainbow. Again, nature that shouts out to us that God's got a covenant with us that we will not break. 
A covenant with us that He will upkeep and that He will never destroy us at the end of the world. Nature. God is using nature. He puts something in nature that when we see it, we can know what He's saying. Now the problem is that once we look at nature, we can also start to worship nature. You notice that? So there's a religion that worship Gaia, Gaia, Gaia. I don't even know how you pronounce it correctly. Yeah. These people pronounce it differently. But it's all about the earth as the mother goddess. And they say it is one of the largest religions in terms of the new age. And when you look at the whole thing about green and, and um, helping up nature, all this global warming and mm -hmm, Greenpeace and all that, it all boils down to worshipping the earth. Which is interesting that, that God gave us as Christians first the uh, he first told us to look after the earth. Authority. Authority. To look after the earth. And he gave us dominion over the earth, and we had to look after the earth. It was the first, first commandment that we were looking for, that we should look after. And it is said that other people have to look after it for us. In spring peace and all that, then we're going to go into that. The point is, I can go and pray at a tree because it's a beautiful spot. And God can answer my prayers, and that means that what will happen, I will go back when I've got a strong and, and a fence thing that I need to pray for to that tree and pray, and God would answer it. The problem is if I don't teach my kids correctly, the next generation will go to the tree for prayers and not to God anymore. And that's the problem. I saw that on a farm when I grew up when there was a drought and my dad had a steel pole, steel rock, that he drove into the, into the land and he prayed at that pole. And, and even in spite of the drought, my dad's crops were so good, so much so that a, 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 um, one of these farmers' magazines, the guys came to, to, to take photos of my dad's crop. Because in spite of the drought, it was growing so well, but then what was interesting, around that pole there was a radius where the crop even grew higher than the rest of the crop. And then after that season, my dad passed away. And I remember the workers on the farm refused to take up that pole. And looking back now, I wonder how many times the pole becomes our ground where it's supposed to be a reminder of what God did, where in the beginning it was a prophetic action, yeah. sometimes it then becomes the entire, the, the, the entire belief system and becomes our God. And I think this is what happened through nature as well. I'm going to close off with this quickly. See, it's, it's easy to, to use nature to, to pray and to connect with God. I sometimes hear people say that, that you know what, Pastor, I don't know what to pray because it feels to me that I pray to the ceiling. Okay, get out of the house then. Um, I can have you walk from the New Harbor right through to Grotto Beach. How long will that walk be? An hour and a half? And I can bet you, for an hour and a half, two hours, I will give you enough to pray about that you will not be able to run out of words if you use these two methods. The one is the apathetic prayer. Apathetic is how we grew up to pray, close your eyes, and you just sit there in darkness, and you pray and we mumble some words 
verse 1. It is going, it is about sitting in nature, closing your eyes, and just experience what is happening around you. And there is a bird chirping, and it's like, Lord, thank you for that bird. Because nature says that that bird is worshipping you. And I just want to join in with it. And I can bet you if you close your eyes, you will start to smell the flowers around you. And to enter into conversation with God about the flowers that you are smelling. And then you will become aware of the wind that is blowing over you, a little breeze, and, and just thanking God for this breeze, and, and knowing that the Holy Spirit is the breath of God, and the Spirit of God, and, and that He is the wind, and, and sometimes blowing over us, and Lord, as, as I feel this wind in nature, in the physical, may I start becoming aware of your breath, your Spirit, your Holy Spirit blowing over me, wherever I am. And I think by closing our eyes, sitting in nature, a lot will come to us that you can pray about. Even though we close our eyes and we sit in pitch darkness, we will become aware of what is around us. See, the second one is scatterfetic prayer. And that's all about images. And that is now walking from the New Harbor to Grotta Beach in conversation with God, looking like, wow, Lord, look at that beautiful flower. Thank you that I can see this today. And walking and seeing a bird, seeing a whale, splashing and jumping. People find money to come to Agmanus to see a whale jump. They sit there for hours waiting for a whale to jump. You don't need to pay nothing, just the petrol money to, to listen. It's nothing compared to what they pay for a holiday here. Why not thank God for that? See, when you walk and you start becoming aware in nature what is around you, you will be able to pray for two hours straight, non-stop. When you get to Grotta Beach, you will still have loads to say to God. But it's because we've learned only one way of prayer. And we sit behind the four walls and we miss the Creator because we don't see the crea creation anymore. And then we watch at the TV box and we think, wow, look how awesome and beautiful nature is. And we have mountains all around us that we can go and walk, that we can smell, that we can taste the stream of water. When looking at the TV, I cannot do that. I can just see it. And may you, when you walk our mountains, when you walk the cliff paths, when you just go and sit in it, may you, may you have a connection with the Creator of heaven and earth. May you experience His glory. May you do it. And enjoy it. Christian. Some of us get really spiritual when we go in nature. The deeper I go into nature, the more I pray for God to not allow a spider to crawl on me. <laughs> so this is what's great about this kind of a series, is that not everybody immediately identifies with each one of these pathways. Yeah. And I think it, it's funny that you, know, when I, you and I are so close because that's probably the hardest one for me, is the nature. This, this arachnophobia is a serious thing. I'll pray for that afterwards. Give it a Have any of you had a, a friend or a family member that you could, you could be in their presence and you still feel like you're as free as if you were alone? If you don't... Their presence doesn't put any sort of expectations on you. Doesn't make you feel some way inside. You've got to please them, and you've got to do something that you know will make them think you're cool or love you more. You have, I hope everyone has at least had somebody like that in their lives. 
maybe it's a brother, maybe it's a, a sister, or those of us who are very blessed sometimes, it can be our parents. This is the, the series, and we're talking about this ways of connecting with God. I think getting to this place with God, this, this place where we're just ourselves, and like we said in, in, in the worship, where we can just, we can really feel, not just think and hope that what we are is enough, but we can actually experience that we are enough. This is really the state that each one of these pathways is another way that, you know, our, our hearts are designed to try to get there. You know, different ways of trying to get there, but they're all, all of us trying to get to the same place. This place of intimacy, this place of freedom, this place of deep communion with God. So, each one of these pathways has different sort of um, methods or things around it, exercises. And this today, when we're looking at the contemplative, what we're really just looking at is a type of person who craves that kind of intimacy so much so that they're willing to put practices and disciplines and they have some techniques, but really it's, it's not about the techniques. Sometimes when we hear the word contemplative, we think of things like meditation and, and you know, silence and cataphatic and apophatic and all of these things. And I want to push that aside. I want to try to get a picture of relationship. Somebody who is, is really trying to practice ways of deepening this relationship. Because Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, if we know how to commune with God, we will create community with others. If we don't know how to commune with God, we will destroy community with others. Because we will look to each other to give us what only God can. We need so much from each other, but there are some things we need from God, and if we, if we don't know how to go there and get it, then we, we will burden each other. Hmm. I think in, in the best of cases, too, uh, I, I, in my life, I've I've wanted to be a contemplative. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I, I do feel like an intellectual, but I, I have looked at the, the and I have uh, hungered after the contemplative life. I see it as, as something so attractive and compelling. This is a definition that our, our uh, guide gave us about this. It says, the contemplative enjoys the simplicity of being with God and cultivating an awareness of God's loving presence. Their primary concern is not on doing things for God, but rather contemplatives gain great pleasure from being faithfully present to God and adoring Him. Faithfully present to God and adoring Him. It's such, a, <coughs> such a simple little thing. Paul says it like this in Romans. He says, make yourself a living sacrifice. You know, this, this idea that you're putting yourself before God, this is... This is really at the heart of all of these contemplative practices. I mean, there's, there's, for you know, the, the history of the church, there's been people who have followed this path of ways to try to nurture this intimacy with God. And there's a, there's a big key point here that although a contemplative person might use nature as one of their techniques, they don't need nature necessarily as a pathway. In fact, one of the big temptations of the contemplative path is that you only see it as a, a personal path. I want to be intimate with God over here, and then you only seek it out, and that's Buddhism. That's not Christianity. <laughs> because it's, that's a pulling away from society, and, and a denial of these things. Christianity is the opposite of that. Yeah. It is contemplation in action. Yeah. Okay? It's this communion with God, not over here on my own, by myself, in solitude. Yes, that's how I nurture it. I remove distractions from my life to try to nurture it. But that's not the practice of it. A contemplative at their best is when they're out in display among the rest of us. When they're showing it what it looks like to carry the presence of God into the 9 to 5 workplace. <laughs> you know, I often wonder and pray for the wisdom to see how can I experience God when I've got to stare at this computer screen for another three hours. <laughs> yeah, so... This is the contemplative journey, and this is, this is a picture that some of the contemplatives have risen up from the book of Deuteronomy as a, a sort of picture of what they would like their heart to be. And so many contemplatives have used this picture. Be not dismayed, for I am with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Wherever you go, be strong and of good courage. You, know, you, you want to pick a personal life vision or motto? That's a pretty good one. <laughs> If you could figure out a way to live where that was how you approached every moment, 
boldness and courage and strength, not fear and doubt or dismay. Man, so many things dismay me. This picture of Deuteronomy, it's, it's, it's beautiful in, in, in our uh, life group. We, we uh, studied, one of our first studies, Anton led us through, was the, this book, The Practice of the Presence of God. Has anybody read this book? I know you read this, Pastor. <laughs> You're living this one, right? This is a, a fantastic book that I would encourage anyone who feels a connection with this contemplative call. I would say the contemplative path is an invitation. God is inviting us always to spend time with Him, to just be adoring in His presence. And so this book was written many, many, many uh, decades, centuries ago, actually, where this brother Lawrence was an unknown monk. He wasn't a famous writer of any sort. He was just a guy working in a monastery, making bread and doing the things that they did, their daily work, their daily chores. And he wrote about his own desire to experience God's presence and to be able to experience everything that he did in his day, the little things. He talks about picking out the stones from the dough so that when the bread gets made, the person who eats that bread doesn't chip their teeth. <laughs> and how that neediest, you know, that could be a, a mundane task of doing that all day long became an act of worship and love for him because he was lovingly picking out those stones. He transformed and redeemed something that I'm sure some of the other monks struggled with. <laughs> In fact, he said so. He transformed it. This is a picture of what the contemplative life looks like when it's really fire. Not just pulling away, but knowing how to come back and be with God. So I want to read a couple things that uh, Brother Lawrence said in the practice of the presence of God that I think will put some flesh on our own contemplative journey. He says, this is his encouragement, that we should establish ourselves in, this, in a sense of God's presence by continually conversing with Him. That's what Rulak just said. That it was a shameful thing to quit this conversation and to think of trifles and fooleries. <laughs> I told you this book was written a long time ago, but we still have trifles and fooleries, right? <laughs> yeah, they, they pump those trifles and fooleries right to us in full bore these days. But think about this. This is, this is so simple. I remember one of the more modern contemplative uh, leaders in our faith or, or contemplative uh, teachers in our faith, uh, Brendan Manning, who passed away a couple of years ago, he wrote a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel. And in it, he told a beautiful story of a man who became a contemplative on his deathbed because he was alone and he had very few people left. And he developed this practice of setting an empty chair next to his bed and, and just envisioning that God was in that chair talking to him. And that's, that's the simple picture. If you can get that simple thing right, but such great faith and sometimes great practice, some people, they get it immediately. This person was probably their whole lives a contemplative who was frustrated. They never got introduced to the path. But then the path found them. To think of that, continually conversing with God, as simple as that. He also says this, we ought not to be weary of doing little things for the love of God. Sometimes we think that spiritual things have to be such great, powerful, life-changing, and world-changing experiences. Brother Lawrence understood. And even though he was unknown in his time, he's kind of famous now. <laughs> his book is on the, one of the Christian top-seller lists of spiritual classics. Because he just focused on the little things, not the big things. But his little things ended up doing big things. Who regards not the greatness of the work? God he said, do little things for the love of God, because he does not regard the greatness of the work, but the love with which it is performed. Hmm. This, is, this is one that helps me, because his encouragement, in, in the book he says something that I've taken away as a picture too, because he, he talks about how sometimes he's very unwilling to be with people. This wasn't a people person and he had a lack of energy. He'd get out of bed he didn't want to do anything. But, but when he knew, when, when he saw his day and all the activities and tasks he had to do as worship to God and things that he could do in God's presence, he had boundless energy. <laughs> Have you ever been there? Yeah? We had a Hank. Hank came and told us that. I think Hank was sick the last time he was here. He could barely even walk around. And also, what's his name who came with the injury? Yeah. From Stellenbosch. Etienne. These guys, I mean, like, and I, when the rain comes too hard and the wind blows, I want to stay home from work. 
these guys understood that in the service of God, all things are possible. And there's another strength that comes. This is what he's saying. Listen to this. How much, how does, he does not ask much of us. Merely a thought of him from time to time. A little act of adjuration. Sometimes to ask for his grace. Sometimes to offer him your sufferings. At other times to thank him for the graces past and present. He has bestowed on you in the midst of your troubles to take solace in him as often as you can. Lift up your hearts in him during your meals and in company. This is a picture that I like. He's not saying go off up on the mountaintop because the mountaintop's not always there. <laughs> but your job is still going to be there tomorrow. <laughs> He's saying, look for it in company with other people, in your meals, at your lunches, at your dinner table. Lift your hearts to him. The least little remembrance will always be the most pleasing to him. One need not cry out very loudly. He is nearer to us than we think. This is the real, I think, thing that the contemplatives get. The person who, who is naturally on this path. This is the insight that God has given them that makes it easier for them. They realize that we don't need to do anything to conjure up God's presence. <laughs> we don't need to do all of this. We don't have to have a drum set and an amplifier. We don't have to smell a certain way. We don't have to move a certain way. God is closer than we imagine. God is right. That little awareness can transform anything that we go through. We have a history of contemplatives in the faith who have gone to such unbelievable lengths, even facing death like our Lord and Savior did. Because purely, they saw the pureness of that connection with God would never go away, no matter what this life brought to them. That takes practice. Some people start way ahead on the journey. I'm still struggling to get there, but it is a picture that has compelled and encouraged me to find that solace in the midst of my life not learn how to separate out. Listen to this. Do not be discouraged by the resistance that you will encounter from your human nature. <laughs> you must go against your human inclinations. Often, 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 in the beginning. You will think that you are wasting time. But you must go on. Be determined and persevere it until death, despite all the difficulties. <laughs> this is a guy who was naturally a contemplative, and he knows that it was still a struggle, still a discipline, it was still a fighting against will. We're called in these pathways, but we still have to offer our will to this. We might be a, a person who's a naturalist, who never actually take the will to go out into nature. We just cut ourselves off from that path and that growth and that, that stimul <coughs> stimulation that can come. He's saying, if you feel like you're not getting it, don't stop. I've sat, I used to teach a class on contemplation during the week, and I remember, this was back in the Bahamas, and I, I remember it was almost like a predictable cycle. I would see somebody come in, and somebody gave them a book, and they had an experience, they saw something on Oprah, and they, they were just ready to meditate. They just thought they were coming into a meditation class. And, and so they came in, and then after about a half an hour, they'd say, so what, what else do we do? They're like, no, we're practicing to, to sit with God and, and get past the mystery and get past the need to answer any questions and, and just really just learn to be with God like we would with our parents. And they're like, yeah, but what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And then I, I saw, like, you know, probably one in every five persons stick with it. And stick with the, the fact that they felt like they didn't know what, but, they, but God was calling that invitation was, was relent, unrelentless. It was just coming, just relentlessly calling them. Like he's calling each one of us right now. Listen to what he says here, because here even Brother Lawrence tipped over a little bit into the, to the shadow side. The shadow side of the contemplative is that they, they tend to uh, judge everybody else who just isn't as in connection with God as they are. <laughs> who hasn't taken the strength of will to nurture this inner peace in, in relationship with God, and you can be a, a little judgmental about it sometimes. I said, I cannot imagine how religious persons can live satisfied without the practice of the presence of God. <laughs> Sounds a little judgmental. Yeah, I don't think you should have been worried about the religious people. <laughs> but this is, this is sort of, on all of these paths, we can tend to, to look and, and look at our path and judge. Well, this person... You know, but we, we know from so many of our other teachings that God does not see what's on the outside. He does not look at what's on the outside. He looks on what's on the inside. Listen to what he says. I cannot imagine that, but 
then he gives us a positive picture. For my part, I keep myself retired with him in the depth of the center of my soul as much as I can. And while I am so with him, I fear nothing. For my part, that's so. That, 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 that's such a. This is Paul. He's saying this is this is how I offer my living sacrifice. This is what I do. It's not. That's not what causes it to happen. That's not what transforms me. That's not what draws me closer to God. This is just my part. I'm responding to the invitation. And if I do that, I fear nothing. I fear nothing. I want that in my life. I want that. I said about techniques, because the contemplatives do have lots of techniques, and I thought a lot about, you know, in the time we have, what techniques, and because I think that we, the Bible talks about meditation, and we brought this term up, I just thought, let's, let's just offer this as a simple technique, and redefine what meditation is, simply filling your mind with aspects of God's character, or focusing on a verse of scripture, and to try to immerse yourself in it. This is one of the many practices that the contemplatives offer it. You can put many, many different words on it. You can practice it in many different uh, strict ways, but ultimately it's as simple as just taking time to say, I'm going to offer this time to God. And I like most, I think, what feeds my over-intellectualized soul <laughs> is the fact that this time when we're, we're experiencing the scriptures or meditating on, you know, the, you know the, the, I think it's the Greek translation of meditation means to chew the cud. Is it? The Hebrew, the Hebrew, right? Means to chew the cud, right? Like, like a cow. Chews, chew on the cud, right? That, that, you know, that, that, that ruminates, exactly. That. This is how the contemplatives would read scripture. They would take a scripture that we would read. This is a, quite a famous psalm that I'm going to read. But I want us to sort of end, just to, to allow this moment, allow this scripture to just sit with us and not... I don't know what your, your, your typical path is. I know in mind, being the intellectual, when I hear words, sometimes I try to form, what does this mean, and what, you know, what, is, what is the message God's trying to tell me, and all of this, but the contemplatives would say no. The contemplatives would say, try not to go down those usual pathways. Try to actually think of yourself like a hunter. Like, when a hunter is, is, is you know, not, I'm not talking about like a, a, a modern hunter who you know, sits up in a tree with a semi-automatic rifle. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about an old school like a, a cave-dwelling hunter who would look out across the savannah and he would have a, a special type of, he would see it, where if he looked at one area too focused, he would miss all of what's going on. So he would try to try to see everything at once in what they would call equal viewing, meaning he's giving equal attention to everything at once. It's a hard thing to practice because we're trained to give focused attention to things. Uh, this little bit of our TV screen, this little bit of our phone, you know, this little frame is how we're trained to see things. The contemplative realizes we've got to wash away that frame because we bring it even to our scripture reading, even to our prayers with God, we've got to remove this frame. So they would say like a hunter, if you can learn to look at everything, when something stirs, then you can focus down on it. Because that's what you want to catch. That might be the fox moving the bushes and you don't want to let it slip away. It takes practice. This might be the first time that you've, you've even attempted something like this, when I read this very famous song. But that's what I'd like us to do. I'd like you to close your eyes, and not because we have to have our eyes closed, but to learn this path at the beginning, it helps to remove the distractions. We learn to contemplate, we learn to experience God's presence, and then we stretch ourselves by taking that awareness out into more and more challenging places. Let's not start trying to meditate in the center of the city square with all the hustle and the bustle. So I'm going to read this scripture, and I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. I just want you to close your eyes and just listen. Let's see where God's spirit moves you in this. God is our strength and ever-present health and troubles. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, and she will not fail. God will help her at break of day. 
Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations that he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress.